My name is Vincent, uh, and thank you, Scott, for giving the talk uh, on infrastructure as a code. I know that's as as we increase in layers of abstraction <laughs> in this space, uh, and and even as I've you know asked other folks, when you see so much YAML fly by, and you know, I, I liked how you said it. it was like it it is readable, but only technically so. I mean, like <laughs> what. I think that's that's often people's immediate cases. Like, what is there a field that wasn't there that I needed to have put there that had some special meaning or you know otherwise? And so you have you have another layer of abstraction on top of that. So, um, is this this uh, this this particular space with Terraform and now with Helm? Uh, I think it, it, in your opinion, you're, are you seeing things come to kind of a consensus as like ways to deploy or at least ways to agree upon how states should be managed and otherwise? Yeah, and I mean, I, I think there's a, a couple of different use cases I've been in. I had to skip my bio slide for the uh, presentation for time, but I've now worked at um, really greenfield startups and I'm currently, of course, working at a Cisco subsidiary, so I've seen kind of both sides of the coin. Mm. And on the cutting edge, I think um, people are feeling like Terraform is is very much kind of de rigueur. It's the uh, it's the app of choice for deploying infrastructure. I haven't seen a lot of new companies choosing to adopt, um, I guess, other ways of managing infrastructure statefully. Um, right. I like. But... I know that there's like SAP has the Gardner Linux out there, and then cluster APIs. You're seeing more and more about it, and the, all the like, do you store it on a cluster, like have an administrative cluster? Or how do you do like stacking or, you know, uh, it, it's like all trying to tackle the same problem. Absolutely. And I think, you know, there's a real use case there for larger orgs that already have these existing just mounds of infrastructure and especially people who have adopted Kubernetes a little bit more quickly, but IAC has taken a little longer to catch up there. And, um, so I, I've also found that we use Terraform in my org, but people are still really getting used to it. Um, and so I, I think the consensus will probably be for something like this that is, you know, natively item potent, that doesn't have any kind of question marks there um, with easy imports. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's an area where I feel like Terraform is a, a real winner for me. And, and as you say, you know, configuration with just like a mountain of YAML. Um, there, there's other areas where I feel like there's convergence around how to make that easier. Um, I was mm -hmm. actually just working on a project recently to put Doll in place to manage uh, YAML. I'm not sure. Are, are you familiar with that one? Not. No. Uh, Doll I've seen is people super talking cool. about like Seabor and all these different like deterministic and like structured languages and converting it around, and it's like yet another abstraction to me. But... Absolutely, and that's. You know, there's a certain point at which you have to, and I, I hate this phrase in Q&As, but you have to find a balance, you know, um, mm -hmm. between like how many layers of abstraction do you have and like how much complexity are you willing to accept? And that, that is different for every org, though. Um, it's different for every project. Mm. The, the, I think the space that is even coming up recently, I'm seeing not just with Terraform, but also like how, how you showed the state that it should be in with Helm and otherwise, is even like introdu introduction of like GitOps and, and some of these projects like Flux. And then now you have another actor in your, you know, scene that's like also in, in interjecting new state and bumping versions and, you know, an yet another thing to reconcile. Uh, is this an area that you're, you're playing with also? Yeah, um, you know, we are managing a lot of our stuff uh, in my current org through GitLab CI. Uh, and mm -hmm. I feel like that's a really good way to kind of provide yourself with, you know, you can have a lot of the actual kind of command flow and application versioning management um, sort of natively handled through containers and GitLab CI. Um, and that's the level of GitOps that we're really working with is that, that kind of pipeline in my work. I've also seen Jenkins use pretty successfully um, to handle mm -hmm. sort of the automation of this process. But like I said in the talk, you know, one of the main areas where there's just a, a degree of risk is out of band changes. Um, and people messing with Terraform code, messing with like Helm charts, um, just like, and, and then having a, a tricky reconciliation um, on the Terraform. And so that the real key to making it work is just like making sure that um, you keep that access to um, out of band changes really locked down. And unfortunately, that's just like the policy enforcement end, the, uh, you know, the prod sec, app sec kind of models. These are like, things where they're not fun to implement and especially at small orgs, there's an impulse to like move fast and break things and just kind of get the terrible yeah. count up. 
just leave it open, let everybody play with it. And... <laughs> but I've seen that cause big problems in my past, and I, I'm here to tell you it's worth it to do some of that locking down really early on in the process. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and I think that's I think that's actually like um, those kind of security talks, and especially in the theme of rejects, like. When you, when you find that you're, you're you're like where are you being told you can't or you know stop no uh, is such an interesting life progression you know, life cycle progression and like development and otherwise is like when you start you want all the guardrails down you want to like just mess it up really well and mm-hmm. then you realize we should have put up every guardrail since the beginning <laughs> so that people were used to you know read only containers and no root access or whatever it is like, like all those things where you're like, Oh, this is painfully inconvenient. You're like, well, it should have been since the beginning. (laughs) And and that's one of the reasons why DevOps as a field, I think is really crucial because, you know, these are folks who know how developers think and they know the problems that are prone to arise when you just kind of like, you know, give the kids the car keys really. (laughs) It's a, yeah. And and I, I don't mean to say that that devs are, are children in this example exactly, but you know it, it's the kind of thing where <laughs> we we are all um, we've all been in the position where we we do want to just ship the thing, um, and yeah. you know I think that's that's another important area where you have to just find that balance. If you're a small org and there's like I've, I've been the only DevOps person in an org, sometimes you can trust the entire staff, but uh, that problem, uh, sorry that that position kind of. I would say gets less and less viable exponentially with every new member of staff you bring on who has access to that stuff. Yeah, that's fair. Well, good. Well, thanks again for giving the talk. Um, and we'll see you online. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Vincent. Thanks, Scott. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.